TopMed Talk. Hi, it's Monty Morrison here, editor in chief of TopMed Talk, coming to you live from Anesthesia 2019 at the Etc. Venues, St Paul's in London. It's day two of Anesthesia 2019. I've just arrived. I uh, have to admit the fact that this was overlapping with the Society for Cardiovascular Anesthesiologists in Chicago. So I abandoned the Top Med Talk team. They literally abandoned them. Desiree Chapel and Sol Aronson carrying the can over back in the USA to come back to join Nick Majerison here. So for the first time, Top Med Talk are coming to you live from two venues at once. Nick, how's it been without me? Well, I feel like I've been straddling both continents as well because I've been hearing all of the output, of course, coming across. Yeah. And I feel like I'm at both conferences. So if you look at the moment online, you've got pieces overlapping each other coming in, pouring into Top Mid Talk from both the SCA, the Cardiothoracic Anesthesiologist Meeting in Chicago, and this wonderful meeting here in London, Anesthesia 2019. So it looks like it was a fantastic day here yesterday, and I listened to the pieces that came out already. I was particularly, I I, uh, uh, contacted people to say that the great interview between uh, Joff Lacey and Professor Hugh Hemmings, um, who is the editor-in-chief of the British Journal of Anesthesia, uh, spoke about potential neurotoxicity in the developing brain. And when I contacted Desiree, because she has to clear the articles as well to get them up, because she's the managing editor, I said it was brilliant and scary. What did you thought when you listened to it, Nick? Yeah, developmental neurotoxicity. What I thought is listening to the care and the caution that goes into the application of anesthesia uh, was so clear there. Because from what I understood on this, and obviously you may have understood it better than I did, there's there's a suggestion from animal... um, animal experiments or animal outcomes uh, that suggest that there might be a problem there but the more you look into it the less clear it is there's a problem with humans is that right yeah it was sort of um so i was i was sort of um well i know i mean i know the subject reasonably well so i would say it was a combination of all oh, that's a bit scary and then i was reassured because mm. then when they talked about the duration of exposure how long the anesthetic had to be given in animal bottles and whether it's translating at all into children i think we have to be cautious very cautious so i think the advice given on the podcast was pragmatic and very sensible i.e if you're going to have elective surgery as a very small person and you don't need to have it until you get a bit older then just wait i thought that's very sensible Mm. but everyone everyone i think everyone's doing their very best to make sure that uh, anesthesia is safe as it can possibly be and everyone remains interested and concerned but um i think we're doing the best we can. Yeah, I think that came over. And for me, it sounds like one of those things that's either going to develop as a conversation or it'll it'll end up resting when it becomes clearer that, you know, we're in a safe position, I think. Now, in the afternoon yesterday, they covered off something we've spoken a lot about on Top Med Talk, which is myocardial injury after non-cardiac surgery or MINS. So Dr. Gareth Ackland is anaesthesia to blame. We'll pick up a bit more on that later on. More about anaesthesia neurotoxicity, post-operative neurocognitive dysfunction and in the final session in the afternoon apart from the health services research center from professor ian moppet we heard about professional conduct from dame claire marks who was uh, at the royal college of surgeons the president of the royal college of surgeons is now chair of the general medical council and the twittersphere was suggesting the fact that actually team anesthesia comes out pretty well when it comes to complaints about professional conduct mm. which uh, if the twittersphere was right Uh, That was reassuring. So we will catch up with folks later and get into the granular detail of that. But now we should talk about what the exciting things that have been happening already today. So the the program, which you can find online, anesthesia and diabetes, assessment of patients for sleep disorders, both covered off in the past uh, well, I think, by Top Mid Talk. But what's happening right at the moment, we're here waiting for the crowd to emerge. I've been in there listening to most of um, the uh, lecture, but now we're going to actually hopefully get into some detailed discussion about it, is the Samuel Thompson Rolling Oration, unusually titled 2018, because there's two orations this year. This is the one that rolled over from last year on cardiopulmonary fitness and perioperative risks insight from the legendary Met study. Now, Ooh. Nick, you've recorded a number of pieces. Yeah about the MET study. We've had very, very early results that uh, myself and Mike Grocott were live at the release of them last year at the International Anesthesia Research Society uh, in the United States of America. And then we've heard the results come out, the main paper, we've discussed it, we've rediscussed it. I think what we're really waiting for now is um, 
the six minute walk test compared to objective cardiopulmonary exercise testing. Do you understand that, Nick? And are you excited about that? Oh, two questions there. <laughs> Well, first of all, measurement of exercise tolerance uh, yeah. before surgery. Is that the full yeah, name so of the trial? To remind ourselves, the uh, cardiopulmonary fitness, so the, the study, large study, uh, 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 multi, multi-centre international study, mainly from Commonwealth countries, if mm. we can put it that way, big effort, uh, thousands of patients looking at major uh, non-cardiac surgery and evaluating fitness in different ways. So let's call it the eyeball test from the physician, the objective testing using a bicycle, so cardiopulmonary exercise testing, and then some blood tests, which includes its so-called pro-BNP, uh, etc. Mm-hmm. I think the, the, we, we've recorded a lot, so people can look up METS. So yep. I'm not going to get into the detail now because we'll get a detail into the discussion because everyone's just coming out for the break. But the thing that's dangling still is, is the six-minute walk test, which sounds as though it's cheap and simple to do, as good as doing an objective cardiopulmonary exercise test with a bicycle. That is the bit that we're waiting to hear about. And we will have a definitive answer on that soon? I, I hope so. I hope we're going to have a definitive answer on that in the next 15 minutes. Wow. Right, so we're break coming. Uh, we'll be back soon. Thank you for joining Top Mid Talk, and thank you for everyone for enjoying Anesthesia 2019 from here in London, the annual meeting of the Royal College of Anesthesia. Top Mid Talk. Nick Majerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com. Com. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. Finally, Top Med Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on Top Med Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.